Hello, my name is Pratesh Raichura and I'm the Head of Science at Michaela Community School. So in today's session, I'm going to be talking about planning effective teacher-led lessons. Now, at the moment around the country, student-led learning continues to be the norm, the popular mode of delivering lessons. Um, but I think there's a bit of a shift that's happening and more and more people are inclined towards using teacher-led lessons. And I myself have come on a bit of a journey. When I started teaching, my lessons used to be very much student-led, whereas now I would say my lessons are entirely traditional, they're teacher-led. Um, and it comes under various names. It could be explicit instruction, I use direct instruction, um, I deliver teacher-led lessons. So my session today is going to be a bit about my transition to teacher-led teaching and hopefully I'm going to share lots of strategies that have really worked for me as a teacher-led teacher um, and hopefully you can use those in your classroom as well. Now I can understand why there's a bit of a tension between student-led learning and teacher-led learning. Um, teacher-led learning has a bad reputation in many ways. Um, if I'm contrasting the two types of teaching, I might say maybe student-led lessons, there's a bit more buy-in from the kids because they have more of a say in what goes on. It might be that some of the content has made has been made relevant to them. So lessons are contextualized, the, the subject knowledge has been contextualized in a way that makes it feel relevant to the pupils. Um, and teacher-led teaching can sound a bit like just lecturing really, isn't that what it really is? Isn't it just really, the teacher talking for a while and not asking many questions and the te and, and the pupils, the students kind of nodding along, making notes. Um, well, hopefully this session will really bust those myths. And there's a couple of things I want to say on that. One, the engagement in teacher led lessons has to come from the subject content itself. And yes, it's true. We're not trying to make it relevant to the kids in a way of bringing something they enjoy to the lesson. That's that's current. That's hip. That's cool for them. That's not what it's about. Um, so that does bring the question up of how is it that you make teacher-led lessons interesting? Um, and the truth is, all of my lessons, which are teacher-led, are highly interactive. It's certainly not me lecturing. It's certainly not me talking for more than a minute at a time without me asking questions. In fact, I'd go as far as saying I ask maybe 50, 60, 70 questions in a 55-minute lesson. And arguably, stu student-led lessons are less accessible and teacher-led lessons are more accessible to pupils if they are done properly, if they are delivered well. And this means that arguably it builds more motivation, more success, and there's a big feedback loop. So I'm going to talk about three things today that link to teacher-led lessons. One, breaking down the subject matter and explaining it really clearly, really explicitly. Two, it's all about firing questions. And this high interactivity is what builds engagement but it also holds people to account to make sure they're listening. And thirdly, as a teacher-led, uh, as, a, as, a, as a deliverer of teacher-led lessons, the teacher must exaggerate everything so that the pupils notice. You're making ex explicit your emotions, your expectations, as well as the subject content. So those are the things I'm going to talk about. So, first of all, break it down. Now, to illustrate to you what I mean by break it down, I'm going to show you a list of several things that a teacher led teacher does in their lesson. And I want you to have a quick read of that list. And then I'm not going to explain it yet. What I'll do is I'll present to you two lessons or outlines of lessons. One that I delivered in my early years of teaching. It was very much a student led lesson. And two, I'm going to explain to you how I would deliver that lesson now using all the strategies that I'm going to share with you today. And hopefully that will help illustrate the difference when I then go on to explain what the points I'm about to show you are about. So take a moment to read through the points now. So I'm going to show you what my student led lesson would, would look like where I don't really use any of this advice. Um, now, if anything, a lot of the, the later points you see on the slide now, they all relate to high quality teacher talk. 
Um, so if there's not going to be much teacher talk, you won't see much of this in action in the next slide. So if I want to teach my pupils about the alkali metals, which are some elements on the periodic table that share some things in common, this is what I did in a lesson many years ago. I gave them this table and I said, your task is to research the properties of these group one elements. And I've put each element and information about it on a poster around the room. And I want you to go around and I want you to fill in your table. You're going to have three minutes for every single poster. And then we'll come back together in groups and you're going to fill in anything you've missed out. Maybe your, your friend in your group can tell you. So that was my the, the task that I used. Now, I don't doubt that this task is currently sitting in thousands of schemes of work around the country in folders, be it for alkali metals or be it for another topic. I know that I designed countless lessons with posters around the room or marketplace activities, this kind of thing. And I can see the thinking behind it as well, because this is what I used to think. The pupils are doing research themselves. They're going around, they're reading and they're, they're, they're thinking themselves. What is the right answer? What can I put in here? They're teaching themselves, they're helping to helping themselves and helping each other to understand that knowledge because they're working in groups. But the reality is that in the 15 minutes they're going to have, I will not be doing much talking. Their entire understanding will develop from what they see on the posters. The problem is, how much of that time are they going to actually spend thinking about science? Will they be thinking, who's in my group? Where do I go next? Or, hmm, I wonder if I can just get the answer from him later. Or, I didn't really understand this. Will he be able to explain it to me? These are the things that are most likely to be running through the pupils' minds. That's why I think this task isn't effective as I once thought it was. So what would I do now? What would a teacher-led uh, lesson look like? Well, this is what I would do now. I would start with a recap of previous content that would have taught in a lesson before where I taught the pupils what elements are, what atoms are. This is because the alkali metals are all examples of elements and they all are made up of different types of atoms. So I'm building on their prior learning where I've taught them explicitly elements are substances made of one type of atom only and I'd make sure they know what an atom is. And then I'd show them the periodic table I would frame kind of the big picture of what we're looking at here. And I'd say, look, here's the periodic table. What does this periodic table show? It shows all the elements. Each element, is it a different kind of atom or could it be the same kind of atom? It's indeed a different kind of atom for each element. And we're going to focus today looking at a particular group of elements. Now, a group is a column on this periodic table. And the first group is the one we're going to be looking at. And these are the alkaline metals. I'm making everything really explicit for the pupils and showing them. I might then chant the group one elements. I say, you say, lithium, lithium, sodium, sodium, potassium, potassium, rubidium, rubidium, cesium, cesium, francium, francium. And by doing this chant, I'm getting them familiar with every single element on group one. And I'm getting them, giving every single member of my class the opportunity to say it out loud and practice and rehearse it. I then asked and posed the question, why are they in the same group? But importantly, that's not a question I'm fielding out to them. It's a question I'm then going to answer myself. Well, they behave. These are all elements that behave in similar ways. They all react in similar ways and they have similar properties. Here, let me show you. And I'd show them. I'll take out some alkali metals and I'll say, look, here are some alkali metals. I'll physically show them in person. Can you see that they're floating in the oil? And in fact, when I pop them in water, they'll also float. This tells me that they're relatively light for the amount that there is. And we say that that these elements have a low density. And when I put it in water, look what happens. There's a vigorous reaction. All the elements in group one react vigorously in this way. And I'd show them one by one. Look how shiny they are. Look how soft they are. Look how little how how, how low their density is. Look at their reactions. I'm making everything explicit. So I'm going to go back to this list and explain what I mean by each of these, these points. So first of all, I've said, do not play, guess what's in my head. 
This is something I see all the time, and it took me a while to break out of this habit when I was first teaching using teacher-led uh, methods of instruction. It's really easy to say, hmm, does anyone know what the group one elements are called when you haven't actually taught it to them? The, the thing is, you might be thinking, oh, maybe, you know, if someone knows, I'll give them the opportunity to have their moment in the spotlight, or maybe someone's worked it out when they've seen the periodic table before. But the problem is what you're really doing there is you're giving an advantage to the advantaged kids, the ones who maybe have really are switched on, have talked about this at home because they've read a book on the periodic table, and you're letting everyone else in the class feel a bit like they ought to know something that they don't and, and not feel very good about themselves. You are not developing thinking skills when you're saying things like, hmm, how do we, what do we think of this when you haven't told them what to expect? Now, it's different if I say I show them the first three elements and I show them how they react and then I say predict what you think is going to happen on the fourth one because I've given them, I've set them up to succeed there. So the rule is if you haven't set them up to succeed in answering a question, it's probably best not to ask it because what you're doing is playing a game called guess what's in my head. More teacher talk, please. Do not set them off if you are teaching a teacher-led lesson on a 15 minute task where they're reading posters around the room. You are not making use of your expertise. You are not making use of your authority as the knowledgeable subject lead in that room. Talk, 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 but make it high quality, make it clear and make it explicit. Third, can you break it down any further? Whenever I'm planning an explanation, this is a question I constantly ask myself. Can I break it down any further? When I'm introducing the alkali metals, I'm thinking, hmm, do they know what an element is for sure? I'm going to make sure I explain that first. Do they know what an element really is when I say different kinds of atom? I'm going to make sure they know what atoms are first. When I say group is a column, do they know what a column is? Let me show them to make sure that anyone who doesn't know what a column is knows what a column is. When I say group one, do they understand that means the very left hand side of the periodic table? Break everything down. If there's anything that you're thinking and you know in your head as a teacher, make sure you make that explicit for the pupils. Fourth, have you sequenced the ideas of your explanation to build a clear picture of the concept? So here you need to be thinking, what's the best order I can present my explanation so it's, it, pre it presents itself as really coherent and a pupil can really build their understanding from one thing to the next to the next sequentially. And that might mean rejigging your explanation as you're planning it initially, but that will really pay off because the pupils will feel like they're really following as you deliver your clear, concise, broken down explanation. Fifth, start with concrete examples before introducing abstract and generic definitions. Now, again, this is something I give feedback on to teachers in my department all the time because it's really easy to fall in the habit of starting with the generic. It's easy when I started my talk to say this is student led learning versus teacher led learning. But if someone was coming to this presentation and they didn't really know what student led learning was and what teacher led learning was, and I'm already talking about the advantages and disadvantages of it, they'd be quite lost. So you have to really know what your pupils already know and start from the most concrete thing possible. So show them the group one elements, show them the periodic table before you go on to explain what they are. Particularly if you're teaching a definition and you're telling them elements are substances made of one type of atom only, that is a bit meaningless unless you've put in the groundwork in the previous lesson to say, OK, here is iron, here's a bit of gold, this is oxygen. Separately, these are all elements because if I was to look at the gold, there's only gold atoms I find. I won't find any other kind of atom. When I look at the oxygen, there's only oxygen atoms. I won't find any other type of oxygen. So. If there's one type of atom, we call it an element. And once you've said that, then introduce the definition. So an element is a substance like oxygen, like iron, like, like gold, made of one type of atom only. Now that you've given the general definition, what the peoples are thinking when they hear those words is one type of atom. Oh yeah, like, like gold and like, like oxygen, the example Sir's just given. They have something to latch that, that general idea onto. They have something concrete to hook it onto. Whereas if you start with a general and then assume they've understood and then give examples, well, the beginning bit was pointless. If you just gave them a generic example, 
Elements are substances made of one type of atom only. So now let's look at some examples. Well, it was a bit meaningless. They didn't really understand it at that point. It's always best to start concrete, move abstract afterwards. Next, could a simple diagram or a useful visual aid aid your explanation? I see, uh, this is often called dual coding, and I see a lot of really good dual coding, but I also see a lot of really bad dual coding. I did not, in this PowerPoint, put a picture of a head when I was saying, guess what's in my head, with a question mark next to it. I did not put a picture of a speakerphone next to point number two, more teacher talk, please. Why didn't I do this? Isn't that dual coding? Isn't that going to help communicate my message better? Well, I don't think so. Because when you read that sentence, more teacher talk, please, you know exactly what it means already. I don't really need a diagram to help you understand that. But if I say periodic table to a class, I might need to remind them and show them, look, this is the thing I'm talking about. When I say lithium, I really want to show them a piece of lithium so they think, oh yeah, it's a silver bit of shiny metal-like thing that seems to float on water, seems to float on oil. Right. That's more concrete. That, that's a visual that's going to help them understand the concept. So I would say only use diagrams or visuals if they're effective. And finally, deliver a clear, slow explanation. Now, that means emphasizing certain points, not speaking mono monotonously, and it means not rushing your explanation. And I often find drawing diagrams live using a visualizer helps me to slow down. Right, next. Now this is something I said to you was a common myth about teacher-led lessons, that they're a bit boring, it's just lots of lecturing. As I said earlier, this couldn't be further from the truth. How is it that I managed to ask around 50, 60 questions or more in a lesson, every single lesson, without fail, pretty much, when I'm introducing something new, certainly? Well, the first thing, before I explain how I do that, is to just outline what the purpose is of asking questions because once you know your purpose you might choose your the question you ask and the strategy accordingly now here is the purpose uh, here are the possible purposes of your questioning it could either be to motivate or to energize now if you're feeling that your class is lethargic and really slow then they're, they're not really understanding what you're saying you need to really chunk it up and ask super easy questions Today we're learning about alkali metals. They are the group one metals. What are the group one metals called? On three, one, two, three. And you expect them all to shout the answer out. Alkali metals. Alkali metals are group, what is it? I've forgotten again. Is it one? Is it group two? On three, one, two, three, one. Um, those kinds of things are motivating and energizing because suddenly the pupils feel like, yeah, I can answer that. I, I, I want to shout my answer out on three. That's one way. But once you think you've really got the class, they're really with you. You then want to move on to really getting them to think hard, to build understanding, and you want to hold them to account, make sure they are listening. I'll explain that as I go on. So these are the methods of questioning I often use. A, cold call. You explain something, and then you pick someone randomly. A Shawnee, can you tell me what the Group 1 metals are known as? And you're just picking randomly. He didn't put his hand up, but you're picking on him anyway. Turn to your partner. Oh, I've realized it says turn to tour partner. It should be turn to your partner. Turn to your partner just simply means you expect the kids to turn to their partner, the person sitting next to them. You give them 15 seconds to rehearse. Three, two, one, hands up. And you expect everyone to stop straight after that. It's really great for rehearsal. It's really great for building confidence in the room when only about half the hands are going up and you want to double that. You want 100% of hands up. Three, call or response, what I've just said. I say, you say alkali metals and you expect everyone to say it at the same time or you might say what's the answer to this question the group one elements are called on three one two three and by giving a really clear signal they all respond in unison and finally there's mini whiteboards i can't believe i ever taught lessons without mini whiteboards once i've used them it's so useful for seeing their thinking getting them to practice their sentences and if you have a clear routine where they show you at the same time on three one two three show you can scan the room and really work out who's got it and who hasn't and it's really good for diagrams as well things you can't really cold call for or, or do a call response or turn to your partner for next um 
what are the types of question? So I've already given some examples. A simple check. Do they know what I've just said? That's like a really simple question. More for motivating and energizing. Summary questions are really useful at checking they've followed your explanation. So can you summarize to your partner what I mean by an alkali metal having low density? Go. And they tell their partner and they summarize what you've said. Three, two, one, hands up. And then you might pick someone to give you that explanation. Or once you've reached the end of a lesson, right, well, today we've talked all about alkali metals. What is it? Why are all the alkali metals in the same group? What is it about them that means they were put together in the same group? Tell your partners, go. Or write on your whiteboards, go. Or, hmm, Tom, tell me the answer, what you think. A good summarizing is a really good challenge. Thirdly, there's links. You might say, how does this idea link to this idea? Um, and that can be as simple as saying things like, um, uh, lithium is an element. What does that mean in terms of the type of atom that's found? Link those two ideas together. And they might say, oh, lithium is an element, which means lithium is made up of only one type of atom. So they're linking their knowledge of element to the example of lithium, as an example. And finally, there's sentence construction, where you want them to really practice specific language. You might get them to, you might give them certain words and you're getting them to build up a sentence using the words. Tell your partner a sentence that uses the words alkali metals and low density. Go. And you'd hope that they might say something like one of, and they might use the word property. One of the properties of the alkali metals is that they have a low density. And you might have to correct them and give them feedback because they may not use those words correctly in a full sentence. So as you're delivering your explanation, the best thing to do in a teacher-led lesson is to have one fact and give them one question that corresponds, as I showed you earlier. So lithium has a low density, which means it floats on water. Which property means lithium floats on water? And then you'd ask them the question. Then flip the question. What does it mean to have low density? So you're making sure they're rehearsing the facts in both directions. Insist on full sentences. If you're saying, what does low density mean? It's not very heavy for its volume. Then you're not expecting a lot from them. Whereas if they say, if a substance has a low density, it means it doesn't have very much mass compared to its volume. Then they're really having to think about those two ideas and build those links. So always insist on full sentences. As you get further through your explanation, you might not just do one fact, one question. You might do one new fact and a question that summarizes all the previous three or four facts that you've asked. And that will help challenge them more as they go along. And you're really pushing them to build understanding there. And finally, a really good one to use is heads down, thumbs up. So I get all the people to put their heads down, put a hand on their head, and then they just open their hands or do a thumbs up. Uh, if they vote for a particular multiple choice question. And that can be really useful for you so they don't cheat, they can't see each other's answers and you can gauge whether they've understood the, question, the, the, the key point of your lesson with a hinge question, something really key. So you might say something uh, like, I'm going to give you three options here. The first option is I don't know and that's often a good idea to give them the I don't know option. Otherwise, you'd get kind of false positives and negatives in your answers. I don't know. The second option is going to be uh, the alkali metals are in, I mean, this is a really easy one, but the alkali metals are in group one. And your second choice is the alkali metals are in group two. Heads down. Open your hands if you don't know. Close your hands. Open your hands if you think the alkali metals are in group one. Thank you. Close your hands and open your hands if you think they're in group two. OK, close your hands and heads up. That's what it would look like. And you'd get a sense. Have they understood it? No. Usually you'd use a slightly more complex question there rather than the simple one I've just asked to gauge whether or not you can move on with your explanation or whether you need to reteach. And reteaching based on feedback is a fundamental principle of teacher-led lessons because you're constantly gathering data from them because teacher-led lessons are highly interactive. And finally, it's always best to pose a question, pause, and then cold call with someone's name. If you do it the other way around and you say, Ashawni, tell me, what are the group one metals known as? Everyone else can basically switch off at that point because they know only Ashawni is going to be asked. So it's best to flip it around and hold people's, get them on the edge of their seats thinking, oh, am I going to be asked? I need to make sure I'm listening. 
So what's the impact of using lots of questions and breaking your explanations down? Well, firstly, people can follow the explanations and that's brilliant because they're building their understanding. They're not left guessing, they're not left frustrated. That's really good for their buy-in. By chunking your instruction, pupils can master one component at a time. And this mastery really le leads them to feel really successful. And the success builds motivation and the motivation drives the, the urge to keep participating more and doing even better. And this positive feedback loop is the thing that means that teacher-led lessons have worked wonders for me in my classroom. And it allows pupils to be praised more often. If I'm asking 80 questions a lesson, 80 pupils have the opportunity to be praised and that is huge for their buy-in and their motivation. And it's not, I guess, a popular thing to say at the moment that, you know, lesson planning is linked to behaviour, but there is a grain of truth in that. If your lessons give opportunities for pupils to be successful, they will behave better because they want that success, they want that praise. Pupils want more than anything to, to, to be given praise and feel really valued. And that's what direct instruction does for pupils. It gives them the opportunity to succeed, to learn, and then be praised when they do really well. And that's really important. So I think, if anything, teacher-led instruction, when done, done well, is the best thing for building relationships with pupils. Finally, I, I said I'll talk about exaggeration. You are the centre of attention if you're doing a teacher-led lesson. All eyes are on you. That means you have to perform like an actor on a stage. If you're delivering a lesson in a monotonous voice and you're speaking like this and the alkali metals are this, the kids will start switching off. You have to emphasize with your voice. You have to praise with warmth. There's a big difference if you're expecting and demanding the attention of 32 pupils to look at you and listen to everything you're saying. When they answer your questions and they're giving you lots of energy, if you say, oh, well done, or you say, wow, well done, that was such a good answer. That makes such a difference. If you can, and you can see it on their faces when they respond positively to the warmth. That's the kind of thing that makes really great teacher-led teaching. Be stern in your reprimand for it to change behavior. If the kids are all slouching and not participating, if you say, right guys, make sure we're sitting up nice and straight, they probably aren't gonna listen. Whereas if you're shocked by that behavior and you say, make sure we're sitting up straight, strong arms up if you're putting your hand up and you really insist that they behave and you, you look shocked. If someone can't answer a very simple question when they should have been listening and you're saying, like, what did I just say? What was the question I just asked? And they can't tell you. And you say, make sure you're listening next time. Or you say, I can't believe you weren't listening. You know, you're losing out on precious learning. I don't want you to fall behind. I'd hate to see you fail. Make sure you are paying attention. Then by having really personal language like that and really showing them you care about them, but being stern, saying, I really want you to do well, and you're letting yourself down by not participating, by not listening to the simple things that I'm saying, then they'll really notice. They'll think, oh gosh, sir really does want me to make sure I'm listening. I will listen. So you have to have high standards in that way. Create a culture for mistakes. Now, if kids get things wrong, of course you want to say, look, I completely understand. It's fine to make that mistake. Um, and in fact, I'm really glad you made that mistake because now we can all learn from it. You shouldn't reprimand a wrong answer, but if it's something as simple as they weren't listening, then you really should demand more of them, um, expecting them to listen. And that's true for all pupils. And all of this means making your expectations and your emotions explicit. Tell them from the start, right, I want you nothing in your hands so you're not fidgeting, and I want you sitting up nice and straight because I'm going to ask you lots of questions. Expect me to say your name at any point. Same way that you're breaking down your explanation, you want to break down your instruction and make it clear to them. I might say your name. You better be ready for your to, to answer the question. I can't wait to really. Um, I can't wait to 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 tell their tell tell your form tutor what a great job you're doing. Because I'm going to be asking you lots of questions today, and I want lots of hands up. The more explicit you make things, the more buying you get, and the better chance you'll have of delivering that explanation well for that pupil for that class. So to kind of wrap up what I've said, I know I've said a lot. One, you're breaking down your explanation because you're building their success, which builds their motivation and their buy-in. Two, teacher-led instruction is not boring. It's not a one-way teacher standing at the front droning on 
it's rapid, it's interactive, and this is what builds engagement. But you can also use your questions to hold people to account to make sure that they are listening and following the explanation. And finally, you need to exaggerate. Exaggerate your voice, exaggerate your body language. Praise them with real warmth and reprimand them. Be really stern when they aren't meeting your expectations. And if you have this balance, then you will see that your pupils understand more, learn more and succeed more. Now, I'll end on an anecdote. When I taught at my last school and, I, and we were introducing this in the department, um, what I saw when I observed one of my colleagues was one of the naughtiest pupils in the school. She was at the back of the lesson secretly answering questions in her booklet, in her book, and had a hand up at the same time trying to answer the questions that the teacher was firing at them really rapidly because they so wanted to please their teacher and they felt so successful because they were able to follow everything in the lesson because it had been made explicit. Nothing was hidden from them. They hadn't, didn't have to discover things for themselves in an inaccessible way. The knowledge was there for them to grab and boy did they grab it with both hands. And that is the power of teacher-led lessons, teacher-led instructions. And I'm hoping that that advice that I've shared with you in this talk today will help you to implement that in your lessons and see the same success. If you do try these out, I'd love to hear from you. So you can message me on Twitter. My handle is there. And you can also check out my blog, bunsenblue.wordpress.com for lots of blog posts I've written on exactly this sort of thing. Thank you for listening.